You don't need to take any notes, take, you do whatever you want, but you don't need to take any notes because everything I'm about to say is written down. Are you ready, Ruby? Uh, no. this, is, this is Ruby. Ruby is going to click on knowledge. We're on, we're on shooting people, which I used to run, okay? And then she's going to knowledge, and then she's going to digital boot camp, bottom right. Well, not bottom, bottom, middle right. And I give a couple of different lectures. One's called Work That Short, and I did that last year when I did my first rave late. And my second lecture is called uh, Digital Boot Camp. Helping filmmakers harness the power of the web, or everything a filmmaker needs to know about the web but is too afraid to ask. Something like that. Um, it is a lecture series and workshop that goes for a whole day, and you're getting a 45, if Kirsty gets her way, and an hour version if I get my way, uh, summary distillation of it. Now, if you scroll down a little bit, it says, here's the slides. So this is the slideshow from an old edition of Digital Bootcamp. So some of it I won't, I'll be surprised when it's up on the screen and you'll bear with me and find that I'm an excellent improviser. Make it big. Good. That'll do. A little bit of advertising. Good enough. Make it big. Ooh. Let's see what's next. This is going to be exciting because we can't preview it. Well, not that old. Good. Um, what's next? Oh, okay. Right. That's it. <laughs> Digital boot camp or fun things to do with people formerly known as the audience. Next slide, please. There they are. Um, it's half glib and half serious when I say things to do with the people formerly known as the audience. What this lecture is about is about many things. And we start with convergence culture, which is a trendy name, word, term that you might hear at a TED conference. Uh, and what it means is, uh, thanks to uh, the connectedness that we all have due to the web and the power, proliferation, and low cost of all of our digital devices, the way in which media is consumed is produced, distributed and consumed, has changed. All of these things, like a perfect storm, have converged to make the audience far more empowered than they used to be. Next slide, please, Ruby. This is me and, oh, that was a bit mean, Ruby. I like that slide. Oh, oh, it's kind of there. what have you done? I have no idea. Okay. Um, Press escape, and just leave it like that, and don't touch anything, <laughs> just, for, just until I get through this slide. This is a uh, graphical representation of my curriculum vitae. I'm not doing it for, uh, uh, to blow, Ooh, I need to say something rude. Not doing it to massage my own ego, but to just give you a sense of how, uh, a, a, a quick tour of my career path to give you an idea of how media works and careers can be truly uh, freelance. So I do run Transmedia Next, a training company, and we'll talk a little bit about Transmedia later. I did consult for Focus Forward Films, which was a short a documentary generating initiative that was powered by uh, General Electric. Um, I did a little, very little, but it looks good, consulting for HBO Europe. I'm on the board of the London Short Film Festival. I'm the COO of Vodo, and we'll come back to them. I'm on the boards of Encounters in Sheffield, Cinevate is a teaching program that I run. I used to run the Edinburgh Film Festival. I'm the producer of marketing and distribution for the Sleep Paralysis Project. And I used to run Shooting People, and anybody who is studying filmmaking of whatever stripe and is about to graduate from this fine institution, you'll find it's, uh, it's cold and windy out there uh, in the British film industry. And Shooting People is one of several resources which we really can help you uh, start out by helping you connect with the rest of the independent filmmaking community in Britain. Next slide, please. I am South Australian, as you would have never guessed from my beautiful voice. And, oh dear. 
Um, I spent a lot of time in Adelaide in the last couple of years and went a bit mad. Uh, very good reason why I live in London and not Adelaide. And one day I walked to the parklands, the lovely parklands in Adelaide, and took many photographs of trees. So digital boot camp comes with native South Australian flora. The other point of a slide with a tree on it is that'll be the chapter break and a good time to ask a question. Slide. Good question, Ruby. Thanks. Let's have a look at the next slide. So we obviously know that digital actually means something else other than the way that we're talking about it in the context this evening, and it's, this is the context that we're talking about it this evening. Um, it used to be expensive to copy a piece of content, right? Make a strike a print of a film cost hundreds of pounds, getting it to the cinema cost dozens of pounds, projectionists, and it all became very, very expensive and complicated thing in the analog world to exhibit. Now it's almost completely free. I can give you a copy of these slides, or probably not given the palaver we went through over the last half. No, but anyway, I could, in theory, give you a copy of these slides which will cost me nothing but the four breaths of air that I've spent whilst putting it onto your memory stick. This means a massive uh, increase in efficiency um, economically. Um, it also means that there's almost nothing which is hard to find. Uh, because it's easy to copy and, and put things up on, on the web. And as soon as something is scarce, it becomes practically free and is robbed of its inherent artifactual value. Prices go through the floor. Um, the upside is that all of you can become enabled as producers, not just people who sit there and pay money to log in to Netflix. Uh, and the other thing is, six, seven years ago, we all thought this is the beginning of the gold rush and not much of it's really paying its way yet. The market is still very immature. Next slide, please. Right, so I don't need to, I don't need to read those out. And, you know, I've shown you where these slides are. You can come back and get them later. But just one um, uh, key one, perhaps, is the third one. Um, what online was, was the afterthought. So Channel 4 would make the TV program, and then when it was kind of done, it would be ready for the sales, advertising, and marketing teams. And it was at that point that it was given to the online team. Here's the thing. Now, use your Webby and make more people watch it. Now, use your Webby is brought in right at the beginning at the script stage. Uh, business models are conceived of uh, online. That sounds obvious. You know, if people now make a living doing nothing but making things literally for the web. Next slide, please. Trees. So that's what we all used to do as an audience. Well done, you really read my timing there, Ruby. I thought that was great. And that's who we are now. Slide. So we've come out of, uh, just come back one more. Just come back one slide, please, Rubes. We've uh, come recently exited about 10, 15 years ago, the age of the middle, which is where you sat at home and you watched Grandstand because that's what was on. Um, now, you can watch what you watch when you want to watch it. There's nothing I can do to stop you doing that. I can't tell you when to stop, start watching, what to watch, whether to pause it in the middle, whether to skip over ads, whether to do it legally or illegally. You're entirely empowered as an audience uh, member. And then what you can also do now is you can make stuff, use the web to show me, then I can show it to mine, and they can show it to theirs. And that's basically the creation of a feedback loop. So with luck and perseverance, because the web is big and cold, it looks like that. That's the picture photograph of the internet. Just there. And it usually gets a titter at least. That, but no. um, feedback loops are a very good, clever way of thinking about broadcasting yourself. Slide, please. That's broken, so the next one, please. This is uh, four... Uh, elements of audience behaviour which have changed the way in which people make content and choose to try and get it to the audience. So that's what I was saying, you do what you want, when you want to do it, on what platform, at, on you know, your, your terms and conditions. Slide. It says it's no longer easy to enforce people's attention. The age of the interface. Um, just click through and let them read that. Can I have a quick sip of wine? If you're interested in this kind of meta consideration, uh, you know, this almost um, um, sociological consideration of how, the, of how media works, 
He could be doing a lot better than listening to me. He could be, for example, listening to him, who's an excellent commentator um, about the Marshall McLuhan of our times, and he's a frequent speaker on TED. Slide. So the people that's freaking out are the old broadcasters, the one who knew how to hide their copy behind internet uh, intellectual property paywalls and such. But, oh yes, good. So I like, yeah, make the next one please. I like the, uh, the analogy of the um, uh, Gutenberg's printing press and the web. Uh, you know, for two reasons. One, Gutenberg's printing press, well, for a couple of reasons actually. I'm going to indulge myself for 20 seconds talking about Gutenberg. He didn't say, hmm, we must make books cheaply and many. Uh, I will build something from scratch. He went, I will use this wine press and re repurpose it and make the printing press out of that, which is a very early example of modding, you know, in the same way that um, roller skates were stuck to a piece of wooden skateboard was, you know, invented. Um, the other thing about that is, you think about that's, five, that's uh, you know, 500 or so uh, years ago, and the first commercially successful print runs were of erotica. And you know, think about what the internet is 60% used for at the moment. Nothing changes. Next slide. Axiom number one for this evening. Tell me and I will forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I will understand. That's the way to treat your audience member as, the, as they are involved in your project, not just being, not sitting there waiting for you to turn up and sell them something. Is the pyramid next? Yeah. No, but, oh, have you got web? web? Yeah. Let's play, so we haven't got time to do both. Maybe we should save, we won't do that. Go back to the slides and we'll do, what that is, is a prompt for me to demonstrate a website which we haven't got time to do, but you can do it yourself, called The Wilderness Downtown. Uh, has anyone heard of that? A couple of hands going up. Um, it just, the reason to play it, even though I know it's not new, um, is that you generate much of it by putting in that you know, postcode at the beginning. Next. Let's just go banging all the way through the social media. We can come back to that. So this has got some tips and ways to think about. This comes, these are slides from the day-long conference. So just keep going until I say stop. This is, um, and stop there. So I want you to think of all of the people who will ever look at your content as if they were arranged handily in a pyramid. So 1 plus 9 plus 90 equals 100% of the people who will ever have anything to do with your project. This is a really old marketing axiom, well predates the internet, very mad men. 1% um, of the people involved in the project are the ones who helped make it, so that's you and the person who shot it and Auntie Beryl who made the lasagna and came down to the set for the day and your cousin, the 19 year old web savvy cousin who's doing your Tumblr account for you. And so you don't need to sell the project to them because they're emotionally or professionally already involved. It's almost impossible also for you as a producer to sell your project to the 90%, the, the mass volume of people who might buy a ticket or chuck you a couple of bucks on Kickstarter or, you know, 69 cents on iTunes. There's just too many of them and you don't know them. But you do know, or these people want to know you, the 9%, the sharers. So these are the people who, with a little bit of careful strategic thinking, you know where to find them because they also share your love of the Velvet Underground and you're making a film about the Velvet Underground. It's going to be so easy to find blogs and forums and Facebook groups and Tumblrs and Pinterests of people. So you go, you find all of them and you go, I'm making, and here's the website for now, and away you go. You keep feeding the 9%, they will feel involved. Give them stuff that no one else is getting. Get, let them look at a thing two days before somebody else. Just, you know, pretty commonsensical stuff. I certainly didn't go to university to learn any of that, although you just have. Um, <laughs> Tangled myself up with. Um, uh, they, they will then be your, your marketing engine. One nine ninety. Print it off, stick it up. Next. Next. Very good. Trees. So in, engage um, 
Uh, uh, quickly about this tree. Uh, this is the back behind that wall is Government House in Adelaide, where the governor lives. And then down this hill, which I, we all, every single Adelaide child has rolled down that hill, and the odd adult. Um, but isn't that amazing, that little stubborn bugger of a tree who's grown at a weird angle, and you just kind of want to go up and go, oh, you're all right. Um, and then the, the French thing, and then the, and the last time I was back, he'd fallen over. I was heartbroken. Anyway, um, quick trip through a couple of very basic social media free tools which are there for you to enjoy. The first one is WordPress, I think. And WordPress is probably the easiest way for you to make yourself, if you're not particularly computery, uh, for you to make yourself uh, a website for your film or your project or whatever. If you are going to be a filmmaker and you are going to put your film into a festival, absolutely make a website for it the moment you have anything. Like design a bit of something based on the thing, create a logo for it, a couple of f photographs or whatever. The moment you've got a little bit of a something, start your website. Um, most film festival programmers will set the rules on how they like to receive submissions to their festivals. Um, but what they probably don't tell you is, if they kind of like the film, they'll go, hmm. And then they'll look you up online. And if you don't exist online, it's, it really is that. So for that reason, and so many others, including running your 1990 campaign and making it easy for people to find you and you get their email address. And, you know, for so many reasons, have a simple website. And uh, who, who's used a WordPress? Uh, who's used a Wix? Who's used both? Which is better? OK, good. You heard it from him. Um, next couple of slides, just skip through them. I've never used Weebly. Uh, just skip through that. They can look back at those later. This, just some examples of some filmmakers' websites. Sorry to be uh, skipping through this, but this is the um, keep going groups. Uh, go back one. Oh, you really gave my gag away there. Really, but you meant to know. Um, that's an important decision to make. Um, if you're making a short film and you have to decide. First, before making that decision, you first have to decide, what have I made it for? Uh, have I made it because I needed to get that piece of expression out of my system and now I'm moving on? Then chuck it up online straight away. Or have I made it so that as many people can see it as possible and chuck it up online straight away? Have I made it because I think it might play some nice festivals, I might get some travel grants, you know, I might go to the Palm Springs Film Festival, maybe win a prize and get picked up by an agent? Don't put it online. Okay, because the moment it's online, you pretty much disqualify yourself from the sorts of festivals that the industry go to, which are the Oscar qualifying festivals. Um, and sales agents also won't touch you with uh, rubber gloves once you've gone up online. Not because they mind so much. In fact, sales agents think, why would I not like a kid who's got 150,000 more views than the next kid? But the people they sell the film to won't because they think, well, the audience is cannibalised because everyone's watched online, so they, they can't sell your film to the broadcaster. Um, it's hard to make a trailer of a um, short, uh, because usually a short has probably only got one idea in it anyway, so that's a challenge, and maybe is solved by a good editor. Um, never put more than 10% of a short film up and never put up more than two minutes. Two clicks forward, please. Three clicks forward, please. Also, oh, I've had many a time somebody has come up to me and said, oh, you know, surely I should just be spending time writing my next film. Or whatever. Now I've got to be this. I've got to be this digital producer and kind of person. Well, the answer is sort of yes and no, and it depends on a couple of considerations, and I've tried to summarise them there. Um, how much time to spend on it is, you know, don't kill yourself, you need to sleep, you need to eat, you need to see your girlfriend, but you uh, probably have a very small budget for your short film at this stage in your career, which means you can't employ someone to do all this website building, 9% building, you know, all of this being the producer of marketing and distribution. Later on, as your budgets get bigger, bigger put the producer of marketing and distribution into your budget in the same breath as putting in a DOP. Absolutely, because a film without an audience is a tree full area in a forest, blah, blah, blah. Um, a, 
And then, you know, get your 19-year-old nephew who lives on the tablet to run your social media campaign for you. You know, the younger they are, the more than they know about it, I, f I find. Um, next, please. Yep. Three. Cool, now we're going to play the Zay Frank thing, which means you need to go to a new tab and go to Kickstarter. We're going to do crowdfunding in five minutes. Okay, I'm going to teach you all about crowdfunding in five minutes. Kickstarter, that's it. And then in the search, Z-E, new word, Frank. Play that. Okay. Down there, yes. You should have just told me to do Back off. It's fun, fun, good times. With your help, I'd like to do it again. Same, same, but different. Think Dora the Explorer meets Locked Up Abroad. Not really. But I will be covering foreign affairs. Yes. And hardline political issues. Special interest topics like amateur taxidermy and botany. Interestingly, these berries were used by early settlers to pretend to have fake nipples. These small berries were also used as fake nipples. Used as fake nipples. Rolled up and used as fake nipples. This was used as a fake nipple. This flower here is a The truth is, I don't really know what kind of show this is going to be because I wanted to emerge from the interactions that I have with you. I want to make a show that you don't just watch. Something unpredictable, strange, and maybe even amazing. If Sergey Brin makes a space elevator, I want us to write the elevator music. It's so noisy. <laughs> if, they, if they come up with a driverless car, I want us to come up with the drinking game for it. In order to get started, I'm looking to raise $50,000, which will be just enough to get me kicked right in the start. The money is going to be used in the following ways. I need a long, hard, professional lens. And by professional, I need something that can make the background really, really blurry. And I need one of those microphones that has all that fuzzy stuff on it and a whole bunch of plastic babies and a place to film that isn't noisy as shit. And I want to hire somebody to help me edit because it's... There are rewards. You can save a baby from the sharks. Your face can show up subliminally in a show. There's books. You can have your face drawn by a scribbler robot. Uh, choose... Choose topics, a Skype beer session, little gifts. I would add an FAQ section here, but no cues have been FA'd so far. But if you have any curiosities, you can email me at zayatzayfrank.com. If you know anyone that was a fan of the show, please help spread the word. With your support, it's going to be great. Same, same, but different. <laughs> this is what happens when your dog needs a flashlight. All right, sorry I couldn't make the sound work, but through my mic, I hope you could hear it well enough. Um, Good fun anyway, right? And that guy uh, is a pretty successful um, web TV creator. Had, had a hit web show well before Kickstarter was invented. You remember what he asked for was 50,000. He made three times as much as that. And I think everything that he did right in making that video should be the rules for making a pitch video on one of these platforms. He's in it, he's in it all the time. So he's backing himself. Sure, he's a born performer because of the nature of what he does for a living, and that's a huge advantage that he will have over most of the rest of us. He sets the tone of what he's going to make. Um, he deliberately tries to make your life, and actually spends some valuable time when he could be setting you up better for asking money, actually just giving you a good time, which you want to kind of thank him for by what? Watching it again, or sending it to a friend, or just feeling pleased. Um, he tells you a very little bit about what you get for your money because he understands that what you get for your money is the fact that you've given him money and he's made the show, not sent you a tin of mints or, you know, you know a DVD. It's like he hasn't really said any of that. You will get a T-shirt and a mug and a stuff. And then what stuff you will get is, well, for this amount of money, you get to save a plastic baby from a plastic ba a baby shark, you know. So it's just playful and fun. Or, I will have a Skype beer session with you. And you think about how many hundreds of proper hardcore fans he would have who would pay a hundred bucks to drink a six pack and have a Skype with their you know, hero, Zay Frank. Um, so I think a masterpiece in a crowdfunding uh, pitch uh, video, he 
also, which you can't see now because the campaign is uh, locked um, because it's closed. He, what, he for a thousand dollars, like something really high, maybe even more, he would walk a mile in your shoes. And so, a video that's on there is the video he made of himself walking a mile in the person's shoes. And he sets it up so beautifully, uh, heartbreaking, really. Um, so he's there, and he's in the car park, and he's cold and complaining about how early it is, and he's going, another dude's shoes, weird, you know, kind of uh, stuff. Um, he, um, so he's making, and he slowly reveals to you that the guy who sent these trainers in is a guy who's lost the ability to walk because of muscular dystrophy, and these were the last pair of shoes he could walk in before he became, you know, wheelchair bound. And you don't know that at the beginning of the video. And you sort of get that towards the end. And all the way through the campaign, um, he would release that kind of stuff to you if you had already contributed. So you, you got more and more and more into, into his world. So um, there is, next slide please, Ruby, thank you very much. A beautiful uh, page demonstration there. Don't worry about him. Don't worry about him. There's really a, there's many, many crowdfunding platforms. Crowdfunding itself is as old as the hills. That's how the Duke of York's monument in Trafalgar Square got built by public subscription. It's exactly <coughs> subscription. It's exactly the same thing. All that happens now is it's super easy for you to do one because there's uh, free web platforms for you to do it. It's very good for filmmakers. Uh, don't ask for your whole budget. If your film's going to cost £12,000 to make, and I see your pitch, uh, video or I read the content around it and it says and I need uh, 12,000 to make my film, I'll be thinking, you know, go to hell, you haven't done the work. Uh, some of the lines in your budget, you're going to be able to get in kind. Why are you now trying to get the money for it? You know, ask me for what you need and I don't want to buy you a camera. You know, no way. But I will pay for you to go to Cuba to do the shoot of the guy that you found who plays in the band. I don't mind contributing to that kind of expensive thing, but that sort of thing helps me feel like I'm getting the film made rather than I'm buying you a red camera. Um, ask for as little as you possibly can. If you're really nervous about not being able to get it over the line, don't use Kickstarter, use Indiegogo. Kickstarter, you only get your money if you hit your target. Um, Indiegogo, you get your money regardless, but you pay more to get your money if you don't hit your target. Kickstarter is also curated, so they decide what goes up onto their platform. You go ahead and put something up on the platform, they review it, they come back to you and say, you need to change this, this, and this. This is great, of course, because who knows better than them what works on their platform and how their community operate. Uh, Indiegogo don't think like that. So Indiegogo is the Morrisons to Kickstarter's Waitrose. Um, there you go, crowdfunding in five minutes. Let's in, say again. Shooting people, um, who is a member? Good. So, uh, shooting people, one thing they can do for you if you do do a crowdfunding campaign is make sure you let shooting people themselves, HQ, know that you are. Because they can then put you up on the shooting people channel on Kickstarter. Which is good for publicity slide. Here's some more. Uh, just go back to that one. Can you read the tagline? Can someone read that out? If you don't give back, no one will like you. Isn't that stupid? I think that's so stupid. Like, it's already, you haven't even, you've stumbled across this website because somebody sent you going, well, oh, here's the thing that's maybe good. We're filming this too. Hi, anyone at CrowdRise? Change your tagline. You're making everyone feel like idiots. It's rude, isn't it? Quick, quick, get your wallet out or you're a prick. <laughs> Slide. Sponsorship's good. British do nice work. We fund good. A lot of these sites won't take charity uh, causes because you know the person who's building a wheelchair ramp at the um, primary school in Kenya has a much more emotional story to tell than the person who's wanting to publish their first book of poetry. But this person, if they're making a film about building the wheelchair ramp in the orphanage in Kenya, well, they'll, they'll fund that. So, but then there are some sites like WeFund which are looking just for social change projects. Slide. Bad name. Good name, American, one of the very first, music only. Terrible name. 
And, you know, right at the beginning when we, where we found these slides, uh, there's a whole chapter on crowdfunding in there for further reading. Slide. Uh, Assemble is a tool which lets you do a, do, do, it uses their interface to help you build that all important web, web presence. And next slide's more useful to understand what it does. Um, that one. So it lets you, it builds a web presence for you, sort of off the shelf, plug in your details, boom, we've got a movie website. And you pay different amounts for it at different times of your film's life. It understands that you need its tools more when you're doing festivals than right at the beginning when you're concentrating on making the film. It also uses a Google Analytics powered data scraper to gather audience for you and find them and recruit them to your project. It can also be used as a, uh, s uh, an online sales agent, so you can become your own sales agent and you can decide what to sell to who, what territories, how much, and they take a piece. So three basic things in one. Um, and the next slide, just because there's another one. I just didn't want to over-endorse one over the other and I do know the guy who made the symbol. Slide. Um, Distrify is exactly what it says it is. Here's what's clever about it. Uh, you don't go to Distrify to watch a movie like you do Netflix uh, or iTunes. Uh, rather, you go to Distrify with your film. You create a, an account for your film and then you upload it and you fill out all the forms and you decide how much you want to sell it for in what media. You know, do I want to do MP4s? Do I want to do password protected streams? Do I want to sell Blu-rays? Um, and different prices in different territories, probably smarter to sell it for more money in America than in the Philippines. Uh, or maybe in this country use this language version, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Just set yourself, set your online shop up. Distrify then sends you back the codes, and you then go to, onto your Facebook page or your film's Facebook page saying, film now available on Distrify, only three fifty nine. And so I then watch your trailer and go, oh, I've always wanted a film about that. So I buy it and the money comes out of my PayPal and goes to Distrify. You look at your dashboard, you see a sale, ka-ching! Um, and then you split the money between you and Distrify, but that's pretty much standard online video on demand sales stuff. The trick is that I am now incentivized to sell your film to my network because I get paid. So if I get the code that I buy that comes along with the film and set up, I just bought this film on Distrify on Facebook or wherever, and you buy it from me, and I get a bit, and he gets a bit, and Distrify gets a bit. So it's got that feedback loop potential. And it's actually doing really well uh, for shorts. Slide. There's another one. There's an, uh, Candy Store is a uh, British video on-demand platform. Um, you probably, if you, especially if you're doing festivals, <coughs> mud in your eye, Ruby. If you are doing, never never get to drink and lecture at the same time, oh, it's brilliant. If you are doing festivals, you probably, and are doing password protected Vimeos or URLs or whatever, I think you probably are going to have the need for 20 DVDs at some point. You might want to hand a DVD out to everybody who made the film with you, for example. You might even decide that you might like to set up DVDs on sale in your little mini shop on your website. And Candy Store and also Amazon at the other end of the scale have one where you go in, you pay a bit of a setup fee, 20 quid, something like that. You upload the file, all the data, the image, and then you put it on sale and it's, it makes them as they sell, one by one. So you're not sitting on 2,000 units of stock that might not sell. That's the Amazon one. There's a tree. That's a pretty good tree. I had a story about that, Ruby, but anyway, it seems that we've moved on. Quite right, Tim. So, this is Vodo, I work for them, and I don't like the use of the word piracy in this distribution space. Uh, to me, a pirate is probably a shirtless, chewing cat with an AK-47 on the back of a rusty uh, speedboat around the Gulf of Aden about to jump on a Norwegian oil tanker, steal it and hold guns to people's heads. That's a pirate. 
not a little 18 year old kid who just wants to watch Star or Trek before everybody else in his bedroom. Okay? <laughs> I'm a copy leftist. I believe in Creative Commons and I believe that if you put a wall between me and content, I will nick it. Of course I will. If you leave it lying around, but that's not your fault, the lying around thing. I know things do leak out. And in some countries in the world, the black market's way bigger than the white market, no doubt about it. And I also love blockbusters, and I know that there won't be any if we all just nick blockbusters. So I don't mind the studios looking, I'm really looking forward to Iron Man 3 on their terms, in the IMAX, in 3D, with a very expensive bucket of popcorn, 20 pound day out, fine, because that's how I want to watch it. But for, you, for our stuff, the stuff that we make, let them nick it. Okay, so what Vodo 1 and 2 did was say, thank you for the license for your film, I'm going to go make you some money. I put it online, I give it to the Pirate Bay. I email the Pirate Bay going, please put this on your front page on Tuesday. Tens of millions of downloads later, and a little tip jar at the end, and it says, if you'd like to help the filmmaker make the next one, chuck something in the tip jar. If you didn't, I hope you enjoyed the film. If it wasn't for you, good luck to you, you know. Um, may your firstborn be a masculine child. Brilliant. <laughs> um, and people would chuck a penny or two in. And we, uh, we ran uh, 700 films. We made uh, a couple of hundred thousand uh, dollars. Uh, we commissioned a six-part bedroom sci-fi series called Pioneer One. We gave that away. We made a hundred thousand uh, dollars, twice as much as we paid to make it. And some films made nothing, but we learned lessons. And now we're releasing Vodo 3. Vodo 3 doesn't really use the pirate networks uh, quite so much because they are inherently unstable because people who run pirate networks tend to get chucked in jail. Uh, and that makes it quite hard to regulate your business flow uh, when your partners are being uh, locked up. Um, <laughs> So, and, but bless them, and we will still run a free-to-share model so that if you come to me and say, I just want everyone to watch my 45-minute documentary about my golden retriever, uh, I'll go, yeah, all right, you know, and then you can organise how it gets out and 10 million people can watch your film. That's free to share, that's fine. I'll also go to people who have content libraries and say, do you want to come up on Vodo? And they will control their own content libraries, set their own prices and whatnot. But the thing we will run is we will release every two weeks a feature film and we will say, pay what you want. Pay nothing? Well, you know, good on you. But don't have to pay. Pay, pay what you think you should pay. I paid £5.50 for Radiohead in Rainbows. That felt exactly right to me. Exactly right. At that stage, I was earning 40 grand a year. Not now, but I was then. And the guy who was earning 40 grand a year and buying CDs still felt that 11.99 was at least twice as much as a CD was worth. And also, well, it's not a particularly high-res version. Of, you know, all this stuff that goes on in your head, which doesn't, you don't get to say when you're in HMV. You, see, you don't get out then if you don't. Maybe HMV's not a good example anymore. Um, and maybe there's something to be learned there. Uh, but we hope that people will feel respected. They'll feel connected to the artist. You know, you would you would pay what you want if you wanted that artist to get more. Uh, the only um, revenue share deal in town which is better is Vimeo's, um, which is 90 to 10, ours is 70 to 30. Um, Vimeo on demand is a marvellous and great thing. Um, and so Vimeo films are different from, from Vodo films. Am I doing for time? Kirsty, over. Uh, yeah. No. Well, maybe about another five minutes. Sure. Uh, Vimeo has, both has a tip jar now. Uh, where did they get that brilliant idea? Oh, I'll never know. And they also have Vimeo on demand. So if you're Vimeo Pro, sixty bucks a year, uh, the the two well, the, the, there are a slate of advantages. But one of the advantages is you can release your film on your video, Vimeo platform to the Vimeo membership and also people who don't go to Vimeo uh, very much and you get 90% of what you sell. The reason they can afford that is because only people who are paying 60 bucks a year are allowed to do it, So, whereas we're not charging anybody. Let's see what other nice slides are up there. Creative Commons I haven't got time for today. I haven't got time for that today. There's always time for a little bit of that though. <laughs>
Let's look at Johnny Cash. We're going to finish with a... I haven't really talked about transmedia um, at all, uh, have I? Not even a bit. And I think that's probably what Kirsty booked me uh, to talk about. Sorry about that, Kirsty. But I run a transmedia training company um, and it is the 17th to the 19th of July in central London. It's very expensive, but it's good value. There are very good teachers and you get looked after very well. Um, but it's kind of really, which is why I'm not pushing the gas, selling it terribly hard to you. It's kind of aimed at people who've got 10 years in the industry, um, not who are about to enter the industry. Um, if, wait, wait for it. If you would like to um, further your transmedia uh, study, um, watch out for the Sheffield Documentary Film Festival. I would go to that. And if you are a shooting people member, you get 100 pounds off the pass. It becomes 150 pounds. <coughs> there's a cross-media summit up there, and there's Sheffield Interactive with lots of display. Um, also, if you even just follow the work that Ruby and I do together on Transmedia, we publish a project of the day. Um, let's watch this one. Oh, the sound thing. show you this and then tell you what it is, but I'll tell you what it is and then show it to you. Remember I was, I was right at the beginning of the lecture I was talking about convergence culture and the playful subtitle or alternative title to the lecture is fun things to do with the people formerly known as the audience. Here's a simple, great and very pleasing idea that's not going to make anybody any money or anything, but it's going to do stuff which is as important as that. Um, What's, it's, it's, it's a bit like rotoscoping, if you like. So there was a video shot, and the video is then remade by illustrators and animators. You go to the site, you log in, you pick your frame, and you go away, and you do it in whatever way you like. Um, and you'll see, um, just play it for a while, Ruby, and see, you might stop when it catches up. There ain't no break. Can you hold turn it up. Johnny down. Cash, not Beethoven. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna ride flat out of the ground. Ain't no break. Can hold my body down. Well, look way down the river. It'll stop now, probably. What do you think I see? Just pause it. I'm so you can see it's a proper video that's been shot and then it's been redrawn. And in the middle, it says highest rated frames. Just click on that pull down, Ruby, and see there's different filters there. Pick one of your choice, Ruby. Now the video is reloading with most brush strokes per frame. This is the one that's playing in a bit like a pianola. But see how there's a column of frames each time. You're only watching the top one. And each of those frames are peer rated. So I've made a frame and it's up on the project. Imagine my joy. I've helped to bring the great man back to life. I've emailed everybody. I've tweeted about it. I've Facebooked it. Go and rate my frame. I want to be in the video. So this boiling competition to actually be the frame. A frame, 24 a second. How engaged is that audience? To not just make a part of the film, but to promote their bit of the film and therefore the film itself. 
truly global, runaway smash hit success project. It's made anybody a penny. But so what? He is standing up on the back of my neck hearing that song alone. Let alone thinking about the sensation that must have gone through somebody the day they realised for one twenty-fourth of a second their frame was being watched by someone in Paraguay. So stop it. Well, don't stop it. I'll just talk over it. If it's playing well, if it's playing well, then let it run. And I can uh, talk myself out with the backdrop soundtrack of Johnny Cash. It'll come out nicely in the film. Um, I, and in many ways, that is a very quick, crude, simplistic encapsulation of what the point of transmedia is. Okay, it's not very much satisfying the idea that something is being watched on many pl platforms. It sort of falls down a bit as a transmedia example there. But it does it very, caref very cleverly and quickly demonstrate the difference between an audience member who sits back and watches Iron Man 3 and someone who leans, for leans forward and makes the stuff and is incentivized <coughs> to do so in that game mechanic uh, kind of way. Now you go on to transmedianext.com and then to the Facebook which really runs this a fun project today. Let's just quickly click through the last couple of slides. Like literally, um, there's a few more in there. There's one about trees. There really is. There it is. Remember the when the ash trees got sick? Poor ash trees, anyway. And we just did Johnny. Just get to yeah, just the last slide, which will be on this. There's some tips. And the last one, don't pee in the pool. That's old. Yeah, just leave it there. So that'll do.